All right, good evening, everyone. Thank you for joining us tonight to hear one of our longtime board members and previous SCAS president, Dr. David Ginsberg, talk about marine species diversity off Santa Cat Catalina Island. I am Shelley Moore, I am the current president of SCAS, and on behalf of the board of directors, I welcome you here tonight. We are excited to have you join us for our seventh SCAS spotlight, showing the work up. Sorry about that. Showing the work of one of our board members and their research contributions to science. I would encourage you to watch previous SCAS spotlights, which are accessible through our website. We started doing these spotlights in 2020 to increase our members' connection to SCAS during the pandemic and to show you the value of your continued support of SCAS and our programs. Programs such as our research training program for our high school students and our grants program for college students. Thank you for so much for joining us tonight. We encourage you to join us by becoming a SCAS member. You can do so by visiting our website. Your membership supports scientists and students in Southern California. Students are eligible to apply for research grants, grants which are due in early spring. And SCAS supports student awards at our annual meeting. Additionally, members who want to publish their research do not have to pay page, char page charges when they publish in our peer-reviewed journal, the SCAS Bulletin. We hope to see you at this year's annual meeting, which will be held on the beautiful campus of the University of California, Santa Barbara. That meeting will be held on Friday, May 5th of 2023. Registration will open early next year, so please check the, webs the SCAS website um, at that time for more information. I am pleased to introduce our moderator tonight, Judy Kim. Judy, it, as a high school student, participated in the SCAS research training program as, uh, from 2012 to 2015 and was an American Junior Academy of Sciences delegate. She is a USC graduate and in current, is currently a second year medical student at the Western University of Health Sciences in Pomona. Please welcome Judy Kim. Hi everyone, my name is Judy and um, thank you for the introduction. Um, I'm just here today to introduce the speaker for um, tonight's um, speaker series, um, Dr. David Ginsberg. Um, so yeah, so as you guys know, this um, will be about um, the marine species biodiversity of Santa Catalina Island and um, that's what the talk will be about tonight. And I guess just a little bit about RTP and what it meant to me um, during high school. Um, it was a really good experience. And um, I think it was like the first exposure that I had to research as a high schooler. So um, I met a lot of great mentors and also other students um, in Southern California who not necessarily went to the same school as me. Um, and had to had a chance to learn about what they were doing um, outside of school and just collaborate on the different projects that we were all able to share and come together at the end of the year. So I think RTP was a very uh, meaningful experience for me, um, just having that exposure in high school and carrying that on to college and um, where I am now. So thank you. All right. Uh, let me go ahead and uh, bring Dave on. Uh, we uh, can, uh, let me uh, re re tell you a little bit about Dave first. Um, David Ginsberg is a professor of environmental science, uh, environmental studies at the University of Southern California and a research associate in vertebrate zoology, specifically echinoderms at the Natural History Museum of Los Angeles County. Dave oversees, or Dr. Ginsberg oversees undergraduate research projects across the, a range of USC and externally funded programs. He holds a PhD in marine environmental biology and an MS in chemical ecology and has worked in a variety of marine environments from tropical coral reefs and temperate kelp fields, <laughs> temperate kelp forests to polar benthic habitats. Please welcome Dr. David Ginsberg. Well, hello all. Thank you. Uh, it's I, I think am I good to go, Shelley? Is it? You are good to go. Good. Great. Thanks. 
I haven't done a Zoom call in a while, so it, I, it's so easy to forget. But uh, anyways, thanks for having me. Um, and I will get, move on with the talk today, which is about marine species biodiversity off Catalina. Uh, let's see. Okay, so just as a quick, uh, just thanks to the, a lot of different people made this happen. Um, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about the project and a little bit about me and other things, but just wanted to give a thanks to all these folks who help in partly with funding and then their time and uh, helping out with the project. So big thanks to those, those folks. Um, so I just wanted to start off with saying that, you know, as, uh, as my, as, as was mentioned, um, I am at USC. I've been at USC now for about 14, 15 years, and uh, I'm in the environmental studies program, but my background is in marine science. And um, I, I think it's important with a project like this that I'm going to talk about is to say that so one of the things that I really, I mean, this is a little bit of my passion as I, I really enjoy natural history. I really enjoy um, kind of marine ecology and subtitle ecology. And I've been a diver for a long time and used diving in my research. And my work during my PhD was, a lot of it was in uh, ice diving and, and looking at developmental physiology of uh, sea stars and things like that. And before that, I did a lot of diving and subtitle ecology in uh, on coral reefs and uh, kind of found myself at USC in an environmental studies program um, when all was said and done, which was really great, but you know, it doesn't, doesn't really have marine in the title. So a little bit of what I'm talking about today is a bit of a journey in trying to figure out how to include my passions in science and getting students involved and trying to make it um, you know, relevant to my current position, uh, which is as a faculty member. So um, kind of starting off with, uh, you know, I had said, I'm a little, I suppose I'm in a way, I'm a dilettante of uh, scientist. I mean, I've done a lot of different things. Um, and one of the things I really would never say that I am is, they, is a fish biologist. Um, <laughs> but that's kind of ended up being a lot of the things that I've done. And uh, I've, I've done a lot of work with seaweeds, um, but I think a lot of the things that I've done recently, particularly in kind of leading me into this uh, biodiversity project that I'm going to talk about is working with seagrasses off Catalina. And that really started kind of when I started at, at USC and uh, there was a student there, which I think some of you may have, uh, Rochelle Tanner as a, as a professor and she's now my colleague, but she started out as, a, as an undergraduate at USC and kind of got me into a project in particular working with kelp bass and, uh, and eelgrass. So uh, it was a little bit of the start of the journey of thinking about, hey, I, there's actually something I can do here using diving and Rochelle is a big diver and, uh, and trying to look at you know, ecology and subtitle ecology and kind of combine the things that I'm interested in. And from that, we published a paper, it was really awesome. Um, and it's really great to have Rochelle is a colleague now um, at Chapman. So that's, you know, wasn't something that I was expecting. And uh, yeah, so that's pretty neat. And then, you know, along the way, as I said, I, I do a lot of diving. So, uh, you know, working with students is really one of the primary things that I do at USC with working at, uh, with undergraduates and uh, working with students that are interested in scientific diving, although not all of them are. Um, and here's just some pictures of different students I've worked with over the years. And, uh, and so being able to work with students is great and trying to find research projects that work with students and their schedules and diving and all those things. It's really fun too, but it's, it's a little bit different than what I had been trained in as far as biodiversity um, is concerned because you know, I was doing a lot of physiology and chemistry and other types of things requires a lab. Um, so, the things that I'm talking about today really kind of reflect, you know, working with students, like I said, um, being interested in diving and looking at some really interesting questions that I think um, are quite valid and topical um, these days. So that really kind of is where I'm coming from with, with this work. A little bit of a long-winded introduction there, but I thought it would be important to kind of bring that up. Um, and then on top of that, uh, the work that I'm gonna talk about today was actually done with a couple of students. So it started off with a student named Audrey Luby, who's 
probably about halfway through her PhD at uh, University of Florida at Gainesville now. Um, and we published a paper from, from this work and it was near shore species biodiversity in an MPA off Catalina. Um, and then I followed that up recently with another um, kind of an updated version of this with another student, um, Andrew Huang, and uh, another USC student who just, he's finishing up his master's at USC now. And um, so that was a lot of fun. So that was, so this work is fairly recent. And uh, yeah, thanks to, to Audrey and, and Andrew because they played a big part in this. So here we are. Um, and, you know, I, as I said, I'm, I think my, if I had to sum up my experience and my background, it's really more of a kind of algal seaweed invertebrate person. Um, and I'm interested in subtital um, systems. And so when I see pictures like this, which is an image that I took from Gustav Pauli, who's at University of Florida, and I used to work with him at the University of Guam, I'm like, oh yeah, that's really cool. That's what I like. Kind of shows, gives us an idea about biodiversity and all the different kind of cool things that are out in the ocean. Um, but, you know, kind of stepping back from that a little bit, um, you know, the oceans are important places. They're, they're incredibly important for ecosystem services. Um, you know, are incredibly dependent on, humans are dependent on oceans for many different things. Um, you know, they're, we're dependent on them for food, for medicine, uh, transportation, recreation, you know, fisheries, uh, economies, um, all sorts of different things. And, and I think, I don't think I need to go into a lot of detail about that because I'm sure many of you, probably if not all of you, realize that. Um, but I think a really important part of the of this issue of um, marine ecosystems and, and you know services that they provide um, is there's a, a bit more intricate part um, perhaps in you know sort of managing this biodiversity and we haven't paid a lot of attention to that or at least I think the many scientists haven't um, because there's just so many different things to do um, and it's an incredible challenge managing marine biodiversity and you know asking questions about you know, well, you know, how many species are there? And, you know, what is ecosystem function all about? And, you know, how many have species have we lost? And, you know, are there some that are more at risk than others? Will there be winners? Will there be losers uh, in the future? You know, it doesn't matter. And how will things like climate change, you know, impact uh, current biodiversity measures and how might that affect, you know, ecosystem services and so on. So kind of backwards forwards of the same question, um, and I, I think my particular interest there is obviously in the biodiversity part. Um, and this question about does it matter? And I think that's really important because it almost seems like a rhetorical one. But as a, uh, when I was finishing up my undergrad degree, I was an undergraduate at UC Santa Cruz and I spent a, uh, a quarter up at UC Davis at the Bodega Marine Lab. And I had a, a really great mentor and um, you know advisor and someone who, who I look to for uh, for just getting ideas about what to do with my life. Um, and for many, many years, he was the uh, the director of the Bodega Marine Lab, Jim Clay, who's a physiologist um, by by training. And you know, he would talk to me about uh, stamp collecting, and not stamp collecting in the sense of you know truly collecting stamps, but this idea of you know oh yeah, you know, you're not going to go out there and just, you know, you, you know, characterizing things, you know, different species and ecosystems. It's just stamp collecting or, or bird watching as sometimes he would call it. Um, and I always thought that was kind of funny because I thought, well, but if we don't know what's there, it's really hard to study, you know, and, and get an idea of how we might conserve and manage natural resources. Um, but he was really kind of more of a lab scientist and uh, he wasn't a field person. But he had a point to some extent, but uh, going back to that question of does it matter, I think it does matter. And I think, you know, if, if I'm a stamp collector, that's fine. I actually really like stamps, but, um, and these are pretty stamps on this picture, but I do think it matters in sort of describing the natural world. And there's a big interest in that now, which is very, um, I kind of, it's a refreshing thing to see in that, um, that, reporting about biodiversity is incredibly important, just as important as, you know, using molecular methods or other sophisticated lab tools to study uh, natural ecosystems. And I think uh, stamp collecting, if that's what we're gonna call it, is actually incredibly important. And that's a bit, 
you know, sort of sort of an underlying theme, I think, of the work that I'm talking about tonight. It's it's characterizing uh, organisms in a natural system, and in this case, I'm calling it species richness, um, and essentially getting an estimate of species richness at a place like Catalina Island or here in Southern California in the waters off Southern California. So, you know, kind of moving to the oceans. Um, if we think about world oceans and think about what we know about them, yeah, we know a lot of things, but, you know, uh, what's kind of interesting is that in, in the perspective of the world oceans, you know, roughly 90% of the species that live in the world oceans are, are undescribed. And that's not to say that we haven't done a lot. We actually have. And, you know, one estimate, and it's, you know, there is no one specific one, you know, definitive answer here, but one estimate is that there are about 500,000 known um, species that are out there. I suppose that you can say have been described in one way or another, um, maybe with a number, maybe with a name. But if you include everything that could possibly be there, there could be as many as you know a couple million to 10 million. And that's really a lot. Um, uh, so again, it kind of comes back to stamp collecting, you know, I think that that puts a little perspective on this that you know stamp collecting might be kind of important if we've only you know given all the tools and technology we have we only know about 10 percent of the species that are actually there and then on top of that if you think about in the world oceans um you think about by volume how much volume of water there is you know depths and, and space that are taken up you know only about 20 percent of the ocean has been explored and in fact, we know more about the surface of Mars and, and the surface of the moon than we know about the, the ocean bottom. And you, know, you can look at maps on Google Earth and you know, see ocean ridges and things like that. And there are a lot of kind of open space there. And you know, it's not because they, there isn't anything there. It's usually because we haven't actually had been able to map it. So there are a lot of technological difficulties that come along with with you know, kind of exploring and studying the oceans. So again, kind of going back to that stamp collecting, it's like, yeah, well, if that's what we need to do, then, then, then I'm happy to be a part of it. Um, but there are other ways to do this rather than just you know, simply manually collecting stamps. But you know, for lack of a better term, I think it's important to realize there is a lot that we don't know about, about the ocean. And, and that's, you know, same can be said about biodiversity. So, you know, coming to the, the work that I, that, you know, I set out to talk to you guys about today, um, a few things. So it's basically focused on, uh, on the Southern California Bight, which is essentially an area that stretches from Point Conception to Ensenada, Mexico. Uh, it's a pretty large area of uh, Southern California coastline. Um, and what's very unique about this is that there's a, there's a, there's a novel circulation pattern in the Southern California Bight, which essentially brings cold water from the north and warm water from the south, and it it comes into a mixing motion, and it essentially mixes right around Catalina Island. So if you kind of look at the arrows on the map, you can see cold water and warm water coming together. Cold water coming from offshore, warm water coming from near shore, and you essentially get a mixing, which causes a, a circulation pattern around Catalina, and uh, Catalina is essentially right in the middle of all that, which makes Catalina a very unique place. Um, some of the species that are found there are quite unique. It has a little bit of the north and a little bit of the south, but um, it is truly a meeting point between these cold and warm waters, which is actually a benefit for those of us that like to go diving out there because it's not too cold and it's not it, it's you know it's not too warm. So it's kind of a really ideal place for all these things. Um, Collectively across the Southern California Bight or this SCB, um, there's generally believed to be somewhere in the realm of probably 6,000 species of seaweeds, fishes, and invertebrates, um, which is a pretty good number of, of species. Um, it, collectively, the Southern California Bight is, has been referred to as a marine biodiversity hotspot. And you know, all of this is going on in a, in a city of you know, greater, greater Los Angeles is about 10 million people. Southern California, probably coastal Southern California has roughly maybe 23 million or so. And, uh, and then, you know, we have two of the largest ports in the world here, Long Beach and, and Los Angeles. And we also have like the third or fourth largest naval base down in San Diego in this area. So there's a lot going on in what 
we would consider to be a, a incredibly biodiverse and, and really rich area of marine biology. Um, so uh, I think it makes me proud to be from Southern California, but also, you know, it makes it a little bit of a challenge too when you're kind of looking at some of these things because there's a lot going on. Um, and then on top of all that, if you take Catalina, which is really the focus here, and I circled that on the map, um, you know, there's roughly about, uh, you know, about a quarter um, of the number of species that you might expect to find in the Southern California Bight are found on Catalina Island. Um, so about 2,200 species or so. Um, and that was some based on some work that was done in the late 1970s. Um, and it really hasn't been followed up since, which again is kind of part of the question of, you know, the stamp collecting of how many species are there in particular off Catalina and, uh, you know, in particular, even more specifically in the area of a marine protected area off the University of Southern California's Marine Lab, the Wrigley Marine Science Center. Um, there are about 4,000 people or so that live uh, on Catalina Island. Um, it's the only island in the Channel Islands that has a permanent civilian population. Um, so it, it doesn't have a lot of people, but there are about a million people a year that visit the island. So there's an incredible amount of ecosystem stress um, and it's smack in the middle of this, you know, this, uh, you know, unique biological transition zone, biodiversity hotspot. And, you know, it really kind of, I think is, it, it begs the question of, you know, what is going on with biodiversity in, on Catalina? And, uh, you know, is it, is it what we would expect? And, uh, and, you know, how will that, it, it does it serve as a useful baseline for, for other studies? So within Catalina, this is the site that, that I'll be talking to you about for, uh, throughout the talk, uh, looking at Blue Cavern Onshore State Marine Conservation Area, or basically the, the Blue Cavern MPA, as I'll call it throughout the talk. Um, there are two parts of it. One is offshore, one is nearshore, looking at the nearshore area. Um, it's a no-take uh, marine protected area, meaning it's protected from any collection of organisms and you can't anchor in that in this area either, um, or at least part of it is, is a no anchor zone. Some of it you can, but a lot of it you can't. Um, and uh, overall, you're not supposed to take anything from there. Um, very popular with divers. Um, it's one of the oldest uh, marine protected areas in uh, Southern California. And it's, you know, one of the more, uh, Kind of a model for many other marine pre MPAs around uh, around the U.S. and it's about one of nine. It's actually one of nine MPAs around the island itself. Uh, and as I, I think I mentioned previously, but um, you know the idea is that under better understanding species richness and estimates of, of biodiversity within this marine protected area off Catalina, I think, will really help to improve conservation efforts overall, um, particularly in the Channel Islands, but as well as the Southern California Bight, because uh, marine protected areas should have some of the highest levels of, of biodiversity that you might expect. Otherwise, it wouldn't be a very good protected area. And, uh, and it turns out we don't know a whole lot about many of these protected areas. I mean, we might have studied many different organisms that go in and out of them, but how many species should they have? And, and how many might you expect to be there? How many were there in the past? How many there are now? We don't really know. And so I'm hoping that the work that I've done here um, with Audrey and, and uh, Andrew will really kind of serve as a baseline for, for future studies of looking at these questions and trying to get an idea for you know, what kind of changes we might be in store for in the future. So as far as recording and, and documenting species, species richness, um, I have to say, I did it through somewhat of an old school. I, I went old school. <laughs> I mean, there are there are various ways you can do it, and questions you might ask are, you know, how, you know, is there a spatial, um, you know, how much spatial resolution do you need? Meaning, you know, do you need to know the difference between one site or another, and how far are those apart? Um, temporal th temporal differences. So, you know, does it matter if maybe you had ten species, you know, in December and 25 in January or, you know, 82 in, in February. So talking about sort of temporal changes. Um, vitality of organisms is important because 
when you're doing this kind of the old school way, which I'll be talking about, um, you're not causing any harm to the organisms, but you might want to collect those organisms and, you know, put them in, you know, ethanol or bring them back to a museum or do something with them. And, you know, that could have an effect if there's only three left and you take, you know, one of the three, that's a problem. Probably not a good idea to take, you know, a, an organism if there's only three left. But, you know, the idea is that you could be impacting those organisms. And then the, the last part here would be detectability. You know, how easy is it for you to find the organisms you're looking for? Are they cryptic? Are they camouflaged? Are they teeny? You know, are they less than one centimeter in size? Are they, um, you know, are they five feet long? Where would you expect to find them? Um, so all of these things, you know, you have to kind of take into account. So there's a whole set of ground rules and I won't go into all of those here, but um, I will say that, uh, you know, one way to do this, and it actually has been done recently out at Catalina at um, the Wrigley Marine Science Center where I was working, um, using molecular sampling, which is a bit more of a sophisticated technique and a group from UCLA, Paul Barber's group um, at UCLA has been working with what we would call eDNA or environmental DNA, which is really useful for um, detecting different organisms. Um, essentially what they do is they collect seawater, um, in different locations, and then they run these against a, a you know, a, a, a series of markers, and they're able to identify species based on species that have been previously identified, um, you know, using genomic sequences. Um, I suppose the biggest downside of this is that in looking at this current article, um, came out in 2021, is that there are a number of organisms um, that you would never expect to find at Catalina which is partly because they're picking up different types of genetic sequence. And just because you picked up the genetic sequence doesn't mean that particular fish would actually be found. So even uh, with these kind of more sophisticated methods, you still need something to be able to, uh, you still need a method that can actually ground truth what's actually there, which is kind of going back to your stamp collecting. Um, so um, I, I haven't been phased out yet. Um, but as far as what I was doing here at Catalina, um, we were going out and doing visual sampling of organisms and essentially doing rover, roving surveys of looking for species. Um, not such a bad thing to do, basically going out and diving and looking for cool stuff. Um, overall, about 1,100 species have been documented so far. Uh, we've used both visual surveys as well as going back into the literature, both gray and primary literature, and using museum collections, and then also uh, looking at uh, unpublished species lists and things like that. And then also personal observations from, from folks. Um, we did this at, at a seven different reef sites um, off Catalina. And overall it's about 68 scuba based surveys which is about 44 hours underwater. And yeah, it doesn't look like a lot but it was a lot um, I think. And um, I'm sure if we spent more time we'd find more things. Uh, I don't think this number, I think this number will go up. Um, whether or not that's actually through my efforts or somebody else's, I don't know, but I'm sure it will go up with time. Um, so getting to some of these species richness estimates here. Um, in this study, I look primarily at fishes, uh, macroalgae, which as well as um, two different species of seagrass, uh, which are actually plants, but um, so macroalgae and marine plants, um, invertebrates, and uh, all of these are basically in the sub or sorry, subtitle. Um, so it, anywhere from you know a few feet to a hundred feet underwater, roughly, is the is the range that we were looking at um, in uh, 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 looking at here. And you know, collectively, it came out to about one thousand ninety-seven, so about eleven 1 hundred species. That's what we observed. But using some some statistical methods, uh, which I'm, I'm not gonna, just for sake of time, I won't go over here, but using some statistical analyses, um, there's some expected values that, that we would get based on these data and based on the number of references that we had, uh, the number of sort of citations and references that we had in looking at these and the amount of time that they've been looked at. Um, and so collectively, what's important here is that we found roughly 1,100 species. We would have expected of all groups to, to find, you know, closer to around 1,800 species. So 
you know, just looking at the number of the ratio of observed to expected, that's about 60% of species that you can account for um, that are existing. But what I find interesting here and kind of goes back to the stamp collecting is that, you know, if your goal is to get all the stamps that are around and you can only get 60% of them, what happened to the other 40%? And, uh, you know, that's kind of where we stopped. Audrey and I stopped in the first article and said, don't really know, you know, did we just not do a good job sampling or maybe we need to spend more time? Maybe we didn't look at the right resources. Um, and, you know, maybe we're just not finding everything. And so Andrew and I looked at that in our second article looking at this. And it really kind of was a question that's been bugging me for a while about, you know, what happened to the other 40%. And, you know, it sounds great to say, yeah, it's probably, you know, they're gone, maybe, maybe, you know, environmental conditions have changed, or maybe we'll never get to 100%, but 60% just seems, it seems odd to me that we can't find that other 40%. Um, so, honestly, I don't know what happened to the other 40%, but I have a few ideas, or at least one main idea. And one of those is that... Uh, these visual estimates, and probably, you know, I also use some of the eDNA methods from the UCLA group, um, or at least I use their data, not their actual methods. But um, I think there's, I think what we're observing is really an underrepresentation of the, the true species richness. Um, and really the bottom line comes down to, you know, a few out of the seven reef sites we looked at, three of them had most of the species that had been recorded by other researchers at other times, um, you know, throughout a roughly 50 year period. And I think the reason for that is that, you know, of these seven different sites, three are really easy to get to. And we go there the most, they're very convenient. They're close to the Wrigley Marine Science Center, WMNC. Uh, they're very convenient, they're easy to anchor at, you know, you can do your work and you can get home. Um, some of these other places are not as easy, which, you know, isn't, that's not, that's, that's no surprise. Um, and so I think, you know, looking at a, over 50 years, we're aware of all the studies been done. Well, they're mostly at these three places. And so if we really wanted to truly increase, you know, get to the bottom of that 40% missing, I think we'd have to really spend a lot of time at these other reef sites uh, and really kind of, you know, up the amount of time we're looking for things there. And I think we probably find a lot more, um, but, you know, again, you got to kind of do this work to find out what you might expect. And maybe that's the next study. I don't know. Um, we'll see. Overall, we had about 170 dis, uh, distinct references and, and, you know, collections, species lists and things. Um, if you added up all these numbers here, they, they, um, they basically are looking at the, uh, the total number of species that we found. Um, and then the 170 here is the number of different studies that we looked at. And collectively, they came from about 18 different phylogenetic groups. So there's a pretty good coverage here of different organisms. So it is quite diverse, which is, that's pretty cool. I was very kind of proud of that, this figure here, which is sometimes known as a heat map. Um, the, the colors that you see here, basically, the, the more red it is, the more number of species you find, the more yellow it is, the fewer species. So zero means we didn't find any of these particular phylogenetic groups and red is where we found quite a few of them. So um, yeah, I think it has to do with just kind of an uneven sampling, not by me, but by people in the field looking at uh, you know various studies over time. So now this is kind of the fun part and um, I, I'm gonna try to get through this. I might have to skip a couple slides because I've, I've been talking a lot, but um, as far as the interesting species, uh, one of them are colonizers. So eelgrass, um, one of the things that I studied and one of the things I studied with Rochelle Tanner, um, eelgrass was first documented at Big Fisherman's Cove, which is located about here. Uh, Zostra marina was documented in 1996, so not all that long ago. Um, it's part of what, uh, the, the National Marine Fishery Service refers to as essential fish habitat, um, which includes refuge from predators. Uh, it's a nursery ground. It's a central area for um, reproduction and all types of things. And amazingly, this, this actually came most likely from Anacapa Island uh, or one of the Northern Islands. And uh, it's not considered to be an invasive, but it is definitely something that's colonized and we find it in a number of different areas on the island. Um, as you can see by the, the circles here, and there's a different species in triangles here. Um, kind of interesting. 
And what's interesting about, what's really cool about the eelgrass is that eelgrass has brought a whole bunch of different species. So um, if you were to look at uh, species lists and, and you know, overviews of, of, of the area, the um, Big Fisherman's Cove and this area of Catalina near two harbors um, in the 1970s and the 1980s, you would not see records of some of these types of fish, these round rays or um, bat rays in particular, this pike blenny, um, because they are very much dependent on the eelgrass. So the, the eelgrass really brought with it a lot of different other organisms um, that like to live in eelgrass. And uh, it's pretty cool that it looks like the, the eelgrass is quite healthy and it's doing well. And I've been working, some of the recent work I've been doing is looking at, is this eelgrass extending into new areas and how's it doing in the areas that's already existing? It turns out it's doing pretty well. Um, and one of the, the best kept eelgrass beds on Catalina is actually in two harbors in the anchorage there. You could get up to you know 5,000 different boaters on a weekend in the summer anchoring in that area or mooring their boats in that area. And it's one of the thickest eelgrass beds you'll find. Um, really pretty amazing. Last, I was there a week ago and we saw on one dive, um, two giant sea bass, a soup fin shark, and um, a, you know, a couple other really kind of unique fish, but pretty amazing. That was only in about 15 feet of water. So it's, it's a really unique place. Um, on kind of the negative side, there has been a, there have been a number of non-indigenous or invasive species coming to Catalina, in particular this brown alga, sargassum, um, competes with native species and, and could cause potential damage to ecosystems, although that's kind of a question that still hasn't fully been answered, but that has no natural predators and nothing likes to eat it here in California. Um, so that's a little bit of a problem. It competes with giant kelp. And then there's these guys. There's a <clears throat> there's an ascidian, which is an invertebrate, and also a bryozoan, another invertebrate, uh, which encrust and foul organisms. And these are particularly, um, they're, they're not the most friendly organisms. They basically grow over whatever they can and uh, they foul lots of different structures like docks and boats and things like that. Number of visitors to Catalina. Uh, so they're kind of temporary visitors. They come in, they generally swim north during warm water events. <clears throat> and I'll talk a little bit about this as I go. Things known as uh, you know marine heat waves. Um, but these guys kind of get entrapped in currents. Sometimes they're chasing food. Sometimes they're just kind of cruising along and before they know it, they their home was in Baja, and now they're you know in the Channel Islands. But it's kind of uh, kind of interesting to find some of these guys, cardinal fish and trigger fish, which you know are much more warm water species found down here in Mexico, and they're fairly regular visitors uh, to California waters. And you know some years they're not there, some years they are. Um, they're not they're not the rarest, but they're not that common either. So really, kind of more of a visitor. Couple different uh, types of seaweeds here, red alga and a brown alga um, have been, people have been looking at these as, and I call them climate busters. They've been looked at alternatives to, uh, to uh, dairy cow feed and possibly a way to mitigate um, the amount of methane that's released from cows using regular corn feed. Um, so there's a lot of interest in trying to get these two species of algae into um, uh, mariculture and do work with that. And uh, that would be really great. Here's a very unique organism. Uh, I call this the survivor. Uh, and there are a number of organisms kind of in this case, not so much survivors, but they've had some geographic rain shifts, uh, meaning their, their previous the area they, they've lived in, um, you know, for, for eons, I suppose, has changed. And, you know, wherever you find them now is really kind of a, a vestige of what used to exist. Um, prior to the 1980s, uh, this particular nudibranch, Philomar californiensis, um, was pretty widespread throughout the Southern California Bight. These days, um, at least for a while, Blue Cavern uh, MPA was, you know, amongst the last vestige of that habitat. I think people have been finding them on the mainland in a few different sites, but um, it's hard to know sometimes because it's not always reported right away. But um, they're 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 definitely not as common as they used to be, and what's kind of cool is they're still found off. Um, off Catalina. These guys, uh, echinoderms, missing in action. Uh, pateria, um, uh, also sometimes referred to as Asterina, but now back to Pateria and this giant spiny star, Pisaster giganteus. Once fairly common on, uh, in the waters off Catalina, 
Um, you see them every once in a while, but for the last 20 plus years that I've worked out at Catalina, I've only seen these guys a handful of times. Um, most likely what uh, the reason for them not being there are mass mortality events, um, El Nino's, uh, marine water or marine heat waves. So warm water coming into the area and these animals are not very happy when they get into warmer water, they tend to um, not do well. Um, and then also a viral pathogen, uh, sometimes referred to as a sea star wasting disease. And there's also one related to urchins um, and, and this wasting is um, causing some really big problems in, and, you know, reductions in these in populations. In fact, um, some are actually to the point where they may actually be endangered. Um, so along with this, uh, you know, we've had a lot of changing environments. And as I mentioned, marine heat waves, it's kind of, you know, caused some really big problems and destruction, uh, or at least degradation of kelp forests which has caused uh, you know, some other organisms to respond and uh, things like urchins might respond to um, having low food by then basically creating an urchin barren um, and essentially eating themselves out of house and home. Uh, and these, what we call marine heat waves are quite threatening these days and they're happening more and more. Um, and essentially what happens is we get these ecosystem shifts. Um, and I won't go into all the details because of time, but you know, in a normal, you know, or I suppose what you might expect to be healthy surface canopy or sub canopy or benthic canopy of areas, um, you have pretty good coverage and diversity of different organisms. But, you know, through these marine heat waves, what's been happening is we've been having degradation of these systems and, you know, the stressors that basically are resulting in essentially changing the abundances of things like echinoderms. So sunflower star, which very likely is, uh, is, endangered in northern parts of California, uh, purple urchins, which are actually way too many of these, or even things like abalone. So um, a bit problematic. Um, kind of moving towards the end here, of, as far as vulnerable and endangered organisms found off, uh, off Catalina, um, a number of different abalone. Most common ones that you would find in, off Catalina are the black, green, and pink abalones. The black abalone is endangered. There's also a white abalone, but it's found a bit deeper and has never actually been recorded off the waters right off the marine lab. Um, but the green and pinks are essentially known as threatened. Um, they're, they're at serious risk. Um, interestingly, we do still find quite a few greens and pinks around uh, Catalina and they're fairly abundant these days, not as abundant back in the you know 20s and 30s when people would essentially just, you know, you know, what's for dinner tonight? I'll go take an abalone um, and uh, there hasn't been an, a black abalone actually recorded off Catalina um, in I think about 45 years. So um, they're pretty rare. If you find one, let someone know. <laughs> um, here's a picture I got from a, 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 a professor at Texas A&M who's now, she was a grad student at, at USC in the 70s. This is Bird Rock in 1972. Uh, you can see basically the mussel beds that are here and what's circled here are black abalone. And she said they used to be stacked, you know, several deep and grad students that would live out at the, at the lab for the summer would go out and basically grab a black abalone for dinner. They were so abundant and, uh, you know, it was pretty common. These days, um, pretty serious fine. It's an endangered species, definitely not something you wanna do. Here's bird rock today. Um, what's pretty spectacular about this, as you can see, not only are there no black abalone in this crack, but there's no mussels and it's pretty much just an algal turf wasteland. Um, now there are a lot of things that are here. So I guess it's not fair to say wasteland, but um, it doesn't look anything like it did in 1972. So 50 years ago, you know, there over 50 years, there's been some really big changes that, um, that you can see visibly. Um, so kind of interesting. Um, Abalone have gone through, you know, cereal depletion. Um, they once were quite abundant, now not so much. Um, finally, you know, looking at, at uh, some of the vulnerable and endangered species, uh, giant sea bass, um, largest bony fish in the kelp forest. Every time I see one of these, I just, I, I think it's, it's like I'm a little kid. I just love it. These can be up to five feet long and more than 500 pounds. Uh, they are endangered, critically endangered by the IUCN, um, and they're just a beautiful fish. They used to be quite abundant in the 
uh, 20s and 30s, they would be caught just as a sport. Um, and this is a 384 pound fish. So either these guys are, either they got the, the size wrong or these guys are just really short. I'm not sure, but um, I don't think that's 384 pounds. I think that has to be bigger, but uh, we're starting to see more of these fish and they are making a comeback, um, which is really remarkable. Uh, and just uh, kind of a couple of videos here showing them um, just really a spectacular organism uh, that you can see um, they're big, they're docile, um, and they are the boss. They're the king. And uh, it's really neat to find these uh, off Catalina still. So I, I do have hope that things can turn around. Uh, and find just a couple, I think this is my second to last slide, um, some recent surprises. I've been diving off Catalina for 22 years, 23 years. Um, I've done, a, it's safe to say I've done a lot of dives out there. And this past summer was the first time I ever saw a green sea turtle. Um, I have heard of people seeing turtles and I have actually seen them in the water before from a boat, but I've never been in the water with one. I came around the corner on Big Fisherman's Cove one day with a group of students and there's a turtle just sitting on the bottom, hanging out, looking at me like, what's going on? I thought that was just amazing. And we keep seeing them. Turns out green sea turtles are one of the winners of climate change. Um, I was talking to some folks at the Southwest Fisheries Science Center in San Diego and they said, yeah, the turtles have been doing really great, lots of food. And uh, it's not uncommon now to see them living off Catalina. There's probably at least six to eight resident uh, turtles there. The other one was the slate pencil urchin. Again, 20 plus years diving off Catalina. I've never seen one person that, um, that saw this and this isn't his picture, but um, he's seen, as far as I know, he's, he's the only person in the last 20 years to see two of them. Um, but our, one of our board members, Gordon Hendler, could probably tell me that for sure. But um, pretty cool to find that. He won't tell me exactly where it is. I kind of know, but um, he seems to think I'm going to pickle it and give it to Gordon. But um, I promised I wouldn't. Um, but really neat to find that because I'm into echinoderms. And just as a conclusion here, um, yeah, I mean, it, it's stamp collecting, but we've got about 1,100 stamps right now. Um, and you know, we found, we've recorded about 60% of the species richness or at least estimated richness. Um, you know, we have more work to do. Not so sure that it's gonna be me to do that, but you know, where's the other 40%? Will we ever get that 40%? And is it just because there's unequal sampling? I'm not sure, but I think, you know, by studying other areas, this kind, these kinds of baseline studies um, are really important for, for insights on spatial and temporal connectivity you know, amongst different populations, particularly in the Channel Islands and other areas in the Southern California Bight. And uh, until we start looking at some of the other protected areas nearby, we won't, uh, we won't really be able to know what that 60% totally means because, uh, you know, uh, can we get better than that? Or, you know, is this an exemplar example of, of you know, stamp collecting? I'm not sure. Um, with that, thank you. Uh, happy to answer any questions. And if you guys ever see any cool species, let me know. Um, and uh, I will be happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dave. That was a great presentation. I really enjoyed uh, it. We, I, do I can't have a hear you, Shelly. Oh. oh, there you go. Yeah, can oh. you hear me now? I can hear you now, yeah. Okay, great. Thank, thank you so much for the presentation, David. Um, great presentation. I really enjoyed it. Um, we do have a question in the chat or in the, um, the Q&A. It is, there has been mentions of many people in regards to the research. Roughly how many people are working on this? Uh, it's so interesting. Um, well, actually, I mean, I think, I think there are a lot of people that have been looking at these questions. Um, I don't have a number, but there's a lot of different ways to do it. And I think, um, you know, a lot of people are using kind of big data sets to look at these things and they've used molecular methods and used other people's, you know, data sets. Um, and uh, surely there are some very sophisticated ways to do it. Um, I think it's a big question and people are looking at this idea of, of biodiversity and, you know, whether you do it using molecular biology or visual techniques or whatever it happens to be, um, I think everyone pretty much agrees that we need to have some kind of knowledge about baseline levels of biodiversity of what's there because we'll never be able to figure out what we've lost if we don't know 
what's there, you know, and we're, we're talking, you know, in the thousands of biodiversity, not millions. So it seems very possible to do it, but it, it is a challenge to, you know, find everything. And then, you know, what limits do you set, you know, as far as, you know, what parameters are you looking in? But I do think a lot of people are interested in this. Great. We have another question. How big are the abalone and do people still eat them? Um, well, they, <laughs> they should not be. The abalone are of a size that you could actually collect. So um, green abalone, uh, I think they have to be eight. I think they have to be, it would, would have to be about nine inches to collect. And um, the, the collection of those were banned, I think in the nineties or the, it might've been in the 1990s. Um, and you can no longer collect those in Northern California either. Um, I suspect people have um, people that, that, you know, anchor in some of these uh, places off Catalina or some of the other channel islands. I'm fairly certain that people poach them. I mean, that really sucks and they're terrible, but, uh, but, you know, when you see really large shells that are just lying on the bottom kind of for no reason, um, you have to expect that somebody ate them, but I don't see it that often. And I usually see just some fairly large ones. I mean, I'll see big abalone. Um, and I'm fortunately diving within the reserve most of the time within the protected area. So certainly nobody should be collecting them there, but, um, I go outside the marine protected area and we find them pretty regularly. I almost always find a handful of greens. So um, one of these days I might find a black abalone, um, but like I said, they haven't been recorded on the island for like 45 years. So the greens are pretty common and the pinks, um, they're, they're not uncommon. Great. Another question for you. What accounts for the decimation of mussels and other animals and algae on bird rock? Is this typical of intertidal habitats around Catalina Island? Well, I mean, I think, I think some of it, there is, there is natural attrition of, of mussels, um, you know, just through wave action and things can, you know, wash up and knock mussels off. Um, but they're pretty resilient. And so I think, and there are predators, but I think the number one reason why we're not seeing the mussel beds that used to be there is, is climate. I mean, water temperatures have changed. We have fairly common, uh, what we, you know, call, you know, warming events and marine heat waves. And that is just, you know, that is, uh, that is not good for a muscle. Muscle does not like that. And if a group of muscles fall off, more will fall off. Um, and, you know, that's not natural to see. You might think it's natural seeing bird rock the way it is now and think, oh, maybe there used to be some muscles. But when you see a picture from the 1970s where it was covered in muscles, you know, you really have to think, what has happened here. And so it's not, um, and, and you can't go on the rock. You can't, you can't go hang out there. It's, it was, uh, it's a protected area. So it's not fishermen that are doing it. It's, it's most likely ocean conditions. And I think it's temperature um, that's causing that. Great. Um, that was a question I had too. Thanks for answering. Yeah. Um, how can I get involved in this type of research? Um, well, you know, the, how can you get involved? I mean, actually, I talked to the Conservancy about that a little bit, the Catalina Conservancy, and what we've been saying is, and there's some really great ways um, for people to get involved. One of them is through, uh, you know, it, it's not quite citizen science, but it, it is a little bit. Essentially, there's iNaturalist, um, which is very useful, and um, there have been these kind of bio blitzes where people will go out and, you know, everyone goes in their backyard and tries to identify some birds or you know, insects and other types of things. And we're, I've been encouraging people that go diving or snorkeling to just start recording what they see. Um, and you can put that into a, an app called uh, iNaturalist. You can get it on your phone and it's, you know, online, it's free. Um, and while you can't always be sure that everybody knows what they've seen, um, you can get a fairly good idea of what's out there. And, uh, and, and I think it's very, very useful. A lot of people are actually using things like iNaturalist because when you think about the numbers statistically, you know, if 87,000 people have all seen the same fish, they've probably seen it. You know, I don't think they're all lying, but you know, if you happen to see a rockfish off Catalina that I know is never found there, um, if only one person reported that, it's probably unlikely, but you know, you can kind of just go by the numbers. So things like iNaturalist have been really useful for people um, in, in getting information and that's a great way to get involved. Awesome. 
Uh, when you were attending school within this field, were there any internships or experiences that greatly prepared you or stood out? Um, no, <laughs> no. I, I, there, uh, I, I mean, mainly I just, I just plotted along. I don't think there wasn't, there were some great experiences I had because I just took a chance. And as I said, the, uh, the person at UC Davis who told me um, about the bird collecting or the stamp collecting, um, it, he also told me in that same conversation, I, I was asking him if I should do my master's degree on, on, in Guam, which is in Micronesia. And he said, academic suicide, don't ever do it. And it was the greatest thing I ever did. And um, it's because I was just willing to take a chance and go do it. So sometimes the most unlikely opportunity ends up being the best opportunity you can ever do. And so, um, you know, you know, they say never look a gift horse in the mouth. So if you get an opportunity to volunteer and do something with someone, you know, sometimes, sometimes that can turn into something really great and you don't know it. So um, no, I didn't do any one specific internship, but I just took a lot of chances and, uh, and it worked. And I think if you're passionate that, I'm assuming you're probably a student who asked that, but, but I think it, it is, you know, you can't work for free your whole life, but you know, there's a certain amount of that that has to come with, with the territory. So just as long as you enjoy it, it's, it's gonna work out. Good advice, thank you. Um, can the bass be seen by Casino Point? Sorry, say that again? Can the bass be seen by Casino Point? Yeah, that's where people see them all the time. Uh, there's like a whole group of them that hang out there. And I don't dive off Avalon, but uh, but yeah, that's apparently there's always a group of them just hanging out. They seem to really like people. Um, and when I when I when they do come near you, it's really odd. They seem to like to hang out. It's almost like they want to hug you, but they they they're a little wary, but they get so close. Um, and you know, it's a big fish. It could. It's certainly. I don't think it's afraid of us, but. Uh, I think they're just wondering what we're doing, but yeah, I heard they're they're often off, um, you know, Italian gardens and Casino Point. Um, we, we've got a few more questions. Is there any indication of how the marine biodiversity at Catalina compares with the other Channel Islands? No, <laughs> and um, and that's because nobody's done anything like this out there, and. Um, I have talked with some people at the park service, you know, because they were interested in, you know, we were just talking about, you know, things that they could do and um, no, and that's the thing. That's what's really interesting is that you know, one of the main things about marine protected areas and um, is that you are actually supposed to know that have a species list for what's there, um, but it would, we would never have any MPAs if we had to do that for every MPA. And uh, it's interesting to me that we're not actually collecting these data in a way that that would tell us give us a species list for different areas so we actually can't compare them even the different mpas off catalina doesn't exist um and uh I'm, it's it's surprising i don't know why um but if someone wants to pay me to do it i'm happy to <laughs> if they want to give me a grant i'm happy to do it um it's it's you know because it's a really cool experience but um it's it does take a lot of time and it um, there's a lot of effort, which is why there's interest in these eDNA methods, which I think could actually be much more, they could be very robust and um, much quicker, which I am support, I do support the eDNA methods, but you do have to ground truth them. So you need someone to go out and, and dive too. Great. We'll take one more question. We're at, we're at 801 right now, so I don't want to keep uh, people any longer. Uh, what continues to keep you interested in the life off of Catalina Island? Um, you find something new all the time, and as long as there's, as long as I, I as long as I, I still have students to work with, and people are interested in diving with me and and listening to my corny jokes and going out in the water, I think I'll still be interested in going off Catalina. Um, I, I, you know, I've done the same. I, I do mostly the same dives in the same area. Um, and, and I always see something new um, and it's, yeah. And what makes it really cool is diving, is, is training students. So yeah, it's great. Awesome. Well, I wanna thank you, uh, uh, Dr. Ginsburg for your talk tonight. Um, great talk, I appreciate it. And, uh, and thank everyone uh, for, for attending.
uh, please reach out if you have any questions. Um, I can, I'm, I'm sure I can share uh, Dr. Ginberg's uh, uh, email address if you have any specific questions for him. And uh, if you have any questions about SCAS, uh, please, please reach out uh, to me directly. Uh, we also have um, our, our annual meeting coming up in May of next year. And it's a great opportunity for students to see um, other students giving presentations, um, what they're doing for their research projects and scientists. Uh, so I encourage you to attend. Um, again, thank you very much. And I appreciate your, uh, your taking the time to watch the presentation and have a great rest of your week.